Jerry Blevins joins us for this episode of the Shane Inning Podcast. We're going to get to your questions. That's really going to be the main part of this podcast, but some news off the top. We'll get to it in a second. If you're listening to the Shane Inning Podcast, it starts right now. Hey, welcome to the show, everybody. It's Doug Williams and Jerry Blevins with you on this episode. A reminder to subscribe, uh, rate, and review wherever you're listening. Apple, Spotify, we appreciate it. And Shane Ming's brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. A couple programming notes. First of all, uh, the rest of the offseason, we'll, we'll be uh, doing episodes once a week unless there's news like, say, a new manager, a new president of baseball operations, a big signing, a big trade those kinds of things we will uh, come at you with an episode but for now uh, we'll be doing weekly and another reminder that uh, weeknights six o'clock on SNY's baseball night in New York you can catch Jerry on there you can catch myself on there it's a good show we hope you uh, watch in addition to listening Um, Jerry the news that we have is that David Stearns has been denied permission to interview Um, you know it's we knew it was going to be tricky with him because he's got a year left on his contract there may be an opt out there right after um so it's it, it was going to be tough it's not like he's a gm uh, meaning that he could interview for a president of baseball operations job uh it would be a lateral move technically speaking so uh you know a lot of mets fans were hoping for one of the big 3 jerry whether it was theo epstein whether it was david stearns or whether it was billy bean uh, our colleague Andy Martino is reporting that Bean is looking unlikely at this point. So it's coming down to a list of, of names that may be president of baseball ops, maybe GM, which feels familiar. And if it does, because this exact same thing happened last off season. Um, what do you think of the idea that another off season could go by and we still wouldn't have somebody in that role? Um, I, I think, first of all, this is kind of expected you know, Sandy had talked about it last year. You mentioned this is what happened last year. It's because teams aren't approaching, they aren't giving the access to their employees quite like they used to for promotions. They're saying, hey, you're under contract. We need you. You're very valuable. So you're going to stick with us. So teams aren't as willing to let guys go back and forth. Um, So I always knew that was going to be an obstacle, especially with David Stearns, even more so with Billy Bean. I, I think it's unlikely. It would be amazing. But, you know, he's in an ownership role with ownership stake. That's a whole complicated issue. Um, You need to get permission from owners, all that stuff. And so I I think like this big name, uh, big splashy name of people that, you know, everybody's going to be excited about because they know who they are. I think that's probably unlikely. I think the more likely outcome is they hire somebody that's up and coming because that's really what all these people were at one point and that's the only way you're going to get somebody is if you're going to hire somebody that has a future in the game that can shape baseball and you're just hiring people. Yeah. And I think um, our first question that we got um, is potentially about exactly what you were talking about. We'll get to that in a second. Um, Look, I I don't think it's the end of the world. I think to your point, Jerry, uh, you know, if this wasn't New York, if, uh, it were a lot of other teams in the league and they had an opening in this role, they would probably hire somebody you hadn't heard of uh, because look, it's a promotion for most. Um, most people who take this, this gig have not done it before. Um, but I understand, you know, Mets fans want, um, you know, maybe some consistency, Jerry, doesn't that sound nice? Like um, instead of hiring a former agent to do it for the first time, instead of having, <laughs> Uh, you know, bad behavior uh, cause turnover in the role twice in the same year. They just want somebody who, who's a proven commodity. And for that, I'm never going to blame them because, look, I, we joke around all the time about how the Mets are never boring. At least I do. And they always give us content. People ask me, hey, what do you do on the, you know, on Baseball Night in New York in the off seasons? I'm like, do you pay attention to the Mets at all? They give us something every week. Um <laughs> But Mets fans want that to stop. They don't, they don't like the LOL Mets. They want uh, somebody who's been there and done that and can kind of figure out what has been uh, wrong inside the, the, the foundation here for so long. 
Um, yeah. So for that reason, they saw Billy Bean or David Stearns or Theo Epstein. And they were like, that's a person who knows the right way to do it and could see instantly what's wrong here. Yeah. Yeah. The Mets fans deserve it. They, they deserve some consistency. They deserve a big name. This is a big market with a big fan base, a very passionate fan base. I get it. I understand it. I, I just don't see... I don't see a possible outcome where not you're just getting a name to appease people versus you're getting somebody that actually is going to be good and deserves this job. So right. that's where we are. They have their eye on the top level and Billy Bean, David Stearns, you know, even Theo Epstein. These are names at the top because that's what they deserve. And then you're not going to settle for anything mediocre. I think what they're going for now might be somebody down here that's unknown that's going to climb into that upper echelon and build something it with the Mets. And I think that's kind of got to be the goal now because there, you don't want to, you don't want to shoot for the middle anymore. Yeah. Okay. So let's get to our Shane eating mailbag. We thank you all for your questions on, on Twitter and Facebook. Um, we're going to start with Jess Sauerhoff. Now I, you know, I played baseball with Jess when I was younger. Uh, he's a very, very big fan of baseball night in New York and Shane eating. So I appreciate oh, it. Awesome. Thanks for listening. Shout and out to in. Jess. Yeah, he's a good guy. Um, but he, you can find him in, at the right one, baby. Um, hello, Jerry and Doug. Um, if the Mets were to not uh, net Bean and or Stearns for their president of baseball operations position, would a potential uh, Josh Burns, Brandon Gomes tandem still excite you? Uh, the the answer would be yes for me because these are, these are commodities that teams have coveted. These are people that are smart, but it comes like if, if outside, like honestly, outside of those top names that we can talk about, I actually don't know anything about anyone. I've right. never spoken to them directly. I just don't, I don't know and until you go through that interview process or, or shake things out. I'm just so, <laughs> I am very underqualified to, to voice in, you know, to chime in on these because I, I don't understand it. Well, that's a good point, Jerry, because look, we know there are two guys from the Dodgers and the Dodgers are good. That's all I know. I mean, if any of our listeners know more about them than I do, I mean, feel free to let me know. But what I know is the next step here, if you're not going to hire one of these guys whose names we know, is to find the smarter organizations who win and do it well, and then interview them. And if they come off well, then you hire them. Um, that, I guess, is the next step. We may not know these names. I don't know what Brandon Gomes' strengths and weaknesses are. For example, I didn't know Jared Porter came from a uh, both a scouting background and had you know done some analytics stuff. That's what interested the Mets uh, originally was that he kind of had a foot in both camps, which you don't find a lot. These are things you find out a lot of the time after they get the job. So, Jess, we don't really have a way to answer your question by other than being like, yeah, sure. If they come off well in an interview and if Sandy Alderson yeah. and Steve Cohen think they're, they're they, smart, then they great. come, they come from a winning formula that that's, you know, even they come from Tampa. Andrew Friedman came from Tampa to, to LA, you know, and they created this network of people that learn how to win as an organization. And being a part of that is a big deal. And so those names are intriguing for that reason. But again, I have no idea who anybody is. Like it just, you know, there's no stats for them for me to be excited right. about. I don't get to watch film of a, you know, their college, you know, uh, I, it's just different. And I, and it's out of my realm of, of understanding, especially when I'm not in the organization to understand the interview process. So it does intrigue me and it, and it seems like a good get, but I, I don't know, Jess, I apologize. I'm just a, I'm just an ex athlete. All right. The next question is from Miller Metz at democracy is just, um, here's my question. Is Jerry Blevins fronting a Depeche mode cover band? If so, <laughs> when and where are they playing? <laughs> I've never been much of a Depeche Mode fan. Um, I can't say I, I know their catalog that well, but uh, there is, you know, I put the hair down today for for the, the for show. This, uh, for this audio, for this audio. Only it's broadcast. for you, Doug, because you, yeah, you gave me you. a compliment and I wanted I wanted to let it let my freak flag fly. So here it is. Uh, I but it. I am uh, I am not going to be 
uh, in a cover band of any sort. Nobody wants to hear this voice when it's singing, not even my own children, but I, I force it upon them. We had a conversation before uh, Baseball Night in New York last week about, you know, Jerry's very curly hair and how I've been dealing with my dog who's hyperallergenic and um, <laughs> using a conditioner that like takes knots out of their hair. And detangled. And they, How'd it go? Yeah, it, it's going. It's we have the help of a, a groomer who only costs about two thousand dollars per bath. So that's good. I'm exaggerating, Ooh, yeah. but it's, it's, insane. yeah, well, I mean, New York um, prices, you're, you're New York you're prices. Premium. It turns out everything here is just more expensive. It's not just like <laughs> meals and rent. It's everything. Um, it's insane. The next question's from Josh Rogers at Josh Rogers, NYC. Jerry, what is Jeff McNeil like as a teammate? Do you think he and Lindor can get along long-term and what was that raccoon dispute really about? Hate the idea of trading a guy who can play four positions and hit, especially since his trade value has dropped. Yeah, I I was spent very little time with Jeff McNeil as a teammate, but I can tell you he's a passionate player. He shows up ready to play every day. And I think you're starting to see him mature a little bit. I think baseball is the ultimate game because it will humble you. And whether you come in cocky or confident, um, you're going to have some failures. It's, it's, it's inevitable. And to be able to grow from those and learn about yourself, it's just part of the game. I like Jeff. I think I couldn't agree with, uh, with, with Miller Metz here anymore that his trade value is low for what well, he Miller brings Metz, to a team. Sorry, Miller Metz was the question before this. This oh, was I Josh apologize. Rogers. This is Josh. Uh, okay, Josh Rogers. I, I, I think his trade value is too low to get rid of him um and as far as him and Lindor getting along this is this is normal that's going to happen you're going to have growing pains you need that you need Lindor to be like hey man i need you defensively to lock it in here or vice versa you got to have to to be able to talk to each other to confront each other we talk about accountability all the time but it takes a, a really strong leader to be able to hey say hey i need you to stop messing around here let's focus we got to turn this double play this is a big moment in the game and they're going to clash. The rat raccoon thing obviously wasn't about a rat or a raccoon. It was about, you know, two grown men standing in front of each other, you know, saying, I need you to do more or I am doing more. And then there's going to be a heated exchange. It happens all the time in baseball. It happens all the time in all the sports. Um, we just don't get a silly story about a rat or a raccoon normally, but they'll be fine. I think the Mets should hold on to them. Uh, McNeil, because I think he's a really good player. I love how he plays the game. Uh, and I think he's only going to get better because I think his maturity level is going to go up. He's going to be able to ride that those streaks up and down a little bit better. And him and Lindor will, will get along fine. If you show up to the ballpark ready to play every day, they'll be fine. I think this is more of a, a position player question to ask. But do you when people say that him getting, you know, Mets are up for nothing and he grounds out, he slams his helmet down and yells an obscenity. And that happens three or four times a game. Do you think that actually bothers his teammates? Yeah. Yeah. It does bother your teammates the same way. Like when your little brother, you know, slams the fridge shut when you're trying to watch TV, like just normal little bull crap uh, that happens throughout a season. Everybody's personality is different. Um, but again, that's that comes with maturity. Is he going to be that guy all the time? Maybe, but it doesn't matter if he pisses off his teammates when he slams his helmet down. It really doesn't. Um, if he starts showing people up and creating a little bit of, of controversy, uh, then that's a different issue. But simply because of the way he slams a helmet, it's not going to create an issue that's that's going to affect the the product or field you know level play. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, okay, Mark Warner asks on Facebook, what happened to the grand plan to use Lugo as a multi-inning weapon? And I think that's a great question by Mark, Jerry, because I, I think, you know, we're going to have that conversation again as, it, you know, if the Mets keep Lugo this offseason, well, you could use him in the rotation. And the talking point used to be, well, Lugo's dominant as a reliever. He's not dominant as a starter. Well, he's coming off a non-dominant year as a reliever. His really his his first. Um, and I think the, the question should be asked again. And I think um, his unique style of giving the Mets two or three innings at a time isn't part of his repertoire anymore. Why do you think that is? 
I think this year was was kind of a, a tough one for him. He had surgery right before camp started. He's coming off injury. And then the Mets immediately needed him in the bullpen because the way the team struggled. And so I think he got thrust in a little bit early. I think he got asked to do more than he should have been at an early time in his in in his rehab, basically. Um, and it it had backfired. And so he was in the uh, and then they were like, all right, let's keep it to an inning. Let's keep your 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 workload down. I think it, he was just thrust into it too fast. I still think his career moving forward, he's going to be that multi-inning guy. The inning plus easy is his weapon. I think to, this was a tough year for him, especially because of, you know, just his lack of uh, uh, spring training and coming off of injury. So I think it's more of a blip on the radar of his career than it is, you know, this is how he is moving forward. Um, our next question is from Mary, uh, and Mary, I apologize if I mispronounce your last name, Irizari, Irizari, um, one Ooh, of the two. Job. I, I think I, Irizari. Irizari. I know her as Mary. She is as dedicated a viewer of Baseball Night New York as there is in the world. She has. She says she's watched every single episode since the show started, um, and she is such a, a nice viewer, and uh, we appreciate the question, Mary. Um, which big name free agent most likely signs with the Mets? Let's kick the tires on some names now. See, that's where her baseball night in New York fandom comes through because we kick a tire routinely on that show, uh, literally. Um, is there a big name, Jerry, that you think might make sense? I think there's a couple that make sense. You know, most likely is is something that. I, again, I don't have my, my finger on the pulse of the front office. That's more Andy Martino area. Uh, but I think they need to replace Michael Conforto's bat. They need a big pop, some pop in the outfield, like a Nick Castellanos, I think would fit perfectly into, into the Mets. You know, he's a right-handed bat, um, which, you know, losing Conforto from the left side is tough, but I think he's, he's got a good pedigree. I think he plays a, uh, a serviceable outfield and he's shown that he can that he can play man and he's he's only getting better um you can see his his career kind of started in Detroit and when he moved on from there he kind of this is who he is he's established himself as this really elite player and I think he would fit really nicely uh and outside of him I would love to see Marcus Simeon from Toronto come to New York um we don't really have a spot for him with Robbie Cano coming back. I have no idea what they're going to do there, but he's another big power impact bat. It would be an amazing, uh, I don't know Castellanos personally, but I know Marcus Simeon personally and having his presence in a clubhouse would just make your team that much better. Yeah. Simeon's the type of player Castellanos too. You'll find a spot for him. Um, whether mm -hmm. that's third base next year, which is a position with some question marks. I, I don't think you let Robinson Cano plug anything up in an off season. Like uh, you don't let his name stop you from acquiring anybody. If you happen to have a duplicate at second base because of him. Okay. You deal with it. Then cross that bridge. Who knows if he's going to stay healthy, who knows, honestly, he doesn't deserve benefit of the doubt in terms of whether he can pass a test for PEDs at this point. So you just, you have to let uh, whatever happens happen. And I agree with both potential acquisitions. Uh, I think those are interesting names. Um, at Lena Terrett says, Hey, Jerry, how was playing with Bartolo Colon? <laughs> uh, Bartolo is a fun guy to be in a clubhouse with because he's, he's a wild card. Um, I played with him in Oakland and New York for, I don't know, three, four seasons kind of combined. He is quiet, doesn't really speak a whole lot but you know where he's at at all times because he loves shocking people being making loud noises when it's supposed to be quiet. He carries around a foam roller, you know, the big foam roller. And if you smack that perfectly on a table or on a door, it creates this loud pop. Uh, and we'll be in our pitchers meeting. All of a sudden you'll just hear this bang and everybody kind of jumps. And then you'll hear Bartolo go, <laughs> got you. <laughs> He'd do all sorts of stuff like that or put a, put a cup on the end of the bat to, to create the little, the air pocket and then smash it on the ground and create a loud pop. He's just a, just a fun guy to be around. Um, you know, you're, you're not gonna, you're not, <laughs> you're not gonna 
open a, a, a deep philosophical conversation with him. At least I never, I never crack that egg. Uh, but he's a fun guy to have at a clubhouse for sure. Okay. So more, more of a chance that um, he will scare you and you'll jump into the air. He's a, he's your... a big fan of the jump scares. Yeah. It was just a very common thing. At least it was when, on the occasion that I'd be in the Mets clubhouse, like Familia would terrify me sometimes. And there were some writers where he would come behind them and like shriek at the top of his, <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, really? yeah, like, I don't know. It's just a thing in baseball clubhouses, I guess, to scare people. Um, Howie, Howie Kowalski on Facebook. Um, how awesome would it be if the Yankees did not resign Aaron Boone and the Mets were to hire him? What would you think of that possibility, Jerry? I think the possibilities are slim because I do think the Yankees retain his services, but I think he's a, he's a good manager. I don't think it would be perfect for the Mets because I don't think the Mets want a Yankee cast off kind of style. I just, and I don't think it fits with um, the philosophy of what they're trying to build here. Um, but it would be nice to, for Mets fans to like get a, a Yankee cast off manager and win a world series, just kind of like a, a rub it in your face kind of thing. But I don't, I don't see it as a great fit um, personally. Good yeah. Question, I think, though. I think he will end up back with the Yankees. I'm not really sure what's taking them so long. Um, I think maybe they want, you know, they wanted to send the message to give the fans the pound of flesh and fire a couple of his coaches. And now they're going to make Boone wait and make it seem like they're really, you know, tossing and turning about this and, when in reality, I think Boone's been coming back the whole time. Maybe I'll look like an idiot next time we talk. He probably wants a, a couple of a year deal, and they're probably like, nah, we'll give you year to year and uh, be on your way. And he's like, let's lock me in. So it's yeah. probably a little bit of contract negotiations. Maybe. Yeah, you might be right about that. Um, you're listening to Shane Anything Podcast brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. All right. Um, so we have a long off season ahead of us, Jerry. Uh, lots, lots of time for people who aren't me to actually sit down and watch movies, <laughs> give us a rain delay recommendation or snowstorm recommendation. We need a new name yeah. for this segment in the off season, but yeah, I'm not sure what we're going to call it, but I wanted to kind of segue. So last week or last, last episode, we did the, 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 the Batman series we wanted to do something a little bit more than just a singular movie. I didn't enjoy that. That's not kind of my realm of recommendation so we, we wanted to backpedal a little bit um, but I didn't want to go all the way yet so I wanted to do a couple of things here this recommendation starts with this is my favorite time of year this is fall the weather's starting to change the leaves are starting to come down so that's my favorite but it's also Halloween time and I love Halloween this is our favorite holiday here at the Blevins household we go all out on decorations and costumes and stuff um, so I love a scary movie I have my whole life uh, my mom used to take me to movies or allow me to see things at way too early of an age than I should have. Uh, but I love her for it because I, I have this affinity for it. So this recommendation is a Netflix trilogy called Fear Street. And I love it. It is like it just came out maybe a month or two ago, sometime during the summer. Uh, the director is Lee Janiak. She is a, you know, up and coming director. Uh, this is an R.L. Stein kind of adaptation, the Goosebumps um, mm. author, but they did an amazing thing. They created this trilogy and it starts in, it takes place in this town called uh, uh, Shadyside, Ohio. And it kind of is the history of the town. It's like Shadyside versus Sunnyvale, Battle of the Baysides, kind of preppy kids and nerdy, you know, poor kids from this side. But uh, the first one is part one is 1994. So the story takes place in 94, obviously. And it's awesome era where, you know, my childhood, they have nostalgia of AOL and mixtapes, but it's also like a slasher film, scream type thing. Uh, and it's wonderful. The, the acting is top level, the directing, the writing, the, it looks cool. The part two is 1978. So it takes place in the same kind of town. It moves from like the mall to the camp, 1978. And it's like this Jason, you know, slasher film from the, the 70s and 80s. And that's super cool. And then the third part is 
1666 and it's like the origins of this curse that has ran centuries and generations through the same town why does it exist and it, and it's like this full fun timeline of three different styles of of horror film all with this same thread of of narrative it's really fun super fun to watch it's on netflix so you can stream it at, at any time at your convenience um and it's lovely it's just a fun perfect time of year I'm a huge Halloween, you know, fan, huge horror movie fan. So I highly recommend it's called Fear Street. All right. Good recommendation. I hadn't heard of it. Um, but again, perfect timing of the year to your point. I happen to think uh, this time of year is incredibly overrated. Um, it, <laughs> I am not surprised. I, I'm just being honest <laughs> with you. I, I, I'm a summer guy. Uh, I, I love um, long days full of sunlight. And as soon as, look, I, I get people like the weather and, and that I part makes it. sense to me that, you know, it's 60 degrees today and that's more comfortable in some ways, but I don't know how you all, all of you can justify uh, saying that this time of year is better when you leave work at 5.30 or 6 and it's starting to get dark. And how, how does that not depress you? Because I'll tell you what, it depresses me almost instantly. It sends me into a spiral. I need sunshine. I need beach or pool. or <laughs> I, I get it. The, the, the more depressing part for me is when you wake up and it's still dark outside. That's, oh. that's harder for me. But I love like, you know, I like fashion and I like to wear a jacket or a sweatshirt and then cover it up. You can wear hats. Like, I just love everything about it. The food is starting to get better just because of seasonal vegetables, all that stuff um, around here in Ohio. By the way, this the shady side Ohio is Fear Street. I just thought it was, you know, kind of ironic. But uh, like the, the corn gets cut down. It's football season, like sweater weather. I, I honestly do like the where I live is so much open space but there's so many like trees everywhere and when the leaves start to change it's just beautiful you get the the swirling of the wind i love this weather versus summer i enjoy 60 degrees 70 degrees more than i do 90 and 100 um i I just it's just more welcoming more nostalgic for me i appreciate it i get it like when you get off work you want to have some some sunshine left but there there are sacrifices to be had you can move yeah. to San Diego and have all the sunshine you want. I know. I know. That's a very good retort to what I'm saying is, hey, man, you, you, no one's forcing you to, to live somewhere. You're, that you're grown, man. In the winter. Um, <laughs> so what do you think, you know, what are, what's the Blevins family going to dress up as? What's the Halloween plan? We're a mixed bag this year. I will tell you that I will be taking advantage of the first time ever having long hair. Um, so it will be incorporated into my costume somehow. I don't want to kind of, you know, open that up. I'm still in design phase, but I think, um, my, my boys will probably be, you know, something along like Maui. They're both have been in huge into, um, uh, Moana. They, they fight over the Moana hook that we got them. We did that last year, but the, the younger one is now into it. So we have kind of things up in the air. My wife will try to do a normal theme, but I will be dressing. I've already got it picked out um, and it will involve my hair being a certain way. Wow. So basically what you're saying is you don't want to give it away. You want to keep it as a surprise, which. No, exactly. It's not like a big deal. Yeah. It's not like a big deal, but I don't want to like, you know, make an announcement here just in case. Maybe I get vetoed by the missus. Maybe next time you're on the pod, let's see, it'll be, yeah, we might, we might have you before Thanksgiving, probably not, but, or before Thanksgiving, before Halloween. Uh, but if we do have you after Halloween, the next time you're on, we'll, we'll look at some pictures. I will we'll at discuss. least post a picture if I, if yeah. I have it and we'll be able to put it up, you know, uh, yeah. on our, on our social media. Good. Um, I'll send it directly to you, Doug. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, a reminder uh, to subscribe to the Shannoning Podcast, <laughs> Apple, Spotify, wherever you're listening. We appreciate it. Uh, and another reminder, Shannoning is brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. Jerry, thanks as always, my friend. Talk to you thank soon. You to the, thank you to the fans for, for the, the great questions, the insightful questions. Shout yeah, out good to questions, Jess. Everybody. Your, what, what position did Jess play? I don't remember exactly. I played... Uh, he, he and I went to different schools, but we played like in the summertime yeah. together. So, oh, I gotcha, he, cool. 
he what and I age both, groups like probably like, high school maybe a oh, little fun. younger yeah yeah Got it. it's been a while and and Jess does some, at least he has uh, done some writing for a local paper in town. And we did a, a story together a few years ago. It was fun. Awesome, so, man. Yeah, it's good yeah. to have local connections. Well, thank Jerry. you guys. And thank you to, to Mary, who's a, a loyal follower Mary of the has seen every single baseball night. That's in incredible. So some of the, our, you know, some of our, our, uh, our really uh, loyal viewers and listeners. Really that's that's what it's about, man. And so yep. I'm glad we can interact a little bit here. Thanks for listening, everybody. And thank you for your questions.